I was finally discharged from hospital in February 1941, five months after I was admitted. After four weeks with the Peels, I reported to the RAF medical examiners in Cairo, and it was a great day for me when I was once again passed fully fit for flying duties. But where were my old squadron now? 80 squadron, as it turned out, were no longer in the Western Desert. They were far across the water in Greece, where for some weeks they had been flying valiantly against the Italian invaders. But now the German armies and air forces had joined the Italians in Greece and were rapidly overrunning the little country. It was obvious to everybody, even then, that the tiny token British Expeditionary Force and the handful of RAF planes in Greece were not going to be able to last long against the German juggernaut. Where did they want me to go? I asked. To Greece, of course, they said. They told me that 80 Squadron were no longer flying gladiators. They were now equipped with Mark I Hurricanes. I must learn very quickly to fly a hurricane, and then I must take it to Greece and rejoin the squadron. I was just beginning to learn where most of the knobs were located and what they were used for when my two days were up and I had to leave for Greece. Bailing out into the Mediterranean didn't worry me nearly as much as the thought of spending four and a half hours squashed into that tiny metal cockpit. I was six feet six inches tall and when I sat in a hurricane I had the posture of an unborn baby in the womb with my knees almost touching my chin. I was able to put up with that for short flights but four and a half hours clear across the sea from Egypt to Greece was something else again. I wasn't quite sure I could do it. I took off the next day from the bleak and sandy airfield of Abu Suwir, and after a couple of hours I was over Crete and beginning to get severe cramp in both legs. My main fuel tank was nearly empty, so I pressed the little button that worked the pump to the extra tanks. The pump worked. The main tank filled up again exactly as it was meant to, and on I went. After four hours and 40 minutes in the air, I landed at last on a Levsis aerodrome near Athens. But by then I was so knotted up with terrible excruciating cramp in the legs, I had to be lifted out of the cockpit by two strong men. But I had come home to my squadron at last. So this was Greece. And what a different place from the hot and sandy Egypt I had left behind me some five hours before. Over here it was springtime, and the sky a milky blue, and the air just pleasantly warm. A gentle breeze was blowing in from the sea beyond Piraeus, and when I turned my head and looked inland, I saw only a couple of miles away a range of massive craggy mountains as bare as bones. The aerodrome I had landed on was no more than a grassy field, and wild flowers were blossoming blue and yellow and red in their millions all around me. At exactly 10 o'clock, I was strapped into my hurricane, ready for takeoff. Several others had gone off singly before me during the past half hour and had disappeared into the blue Grecian sky. I took off and climbed to 5,000 feet and started circling above the flying field while somebody in the ops room tried to contact me on his amazingly inefficient apparatus. My code name was Blue Four. Through a storm of static, a faraway voice kept saying in my earphones, Blue Four, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And I kept replying, Yes, but only just. Await orders, the faint voice said. Listen out. I cruised around, admiring the blue sea to the south and the great mountains to the north. And I was just beginning to think to myself that this was a very nice way to fight a war, when the static erupted again and the voice said, Blue Four, are you receiving me? Yes, I said, but speak louder, please. Bandits over shipping at Calchas the voice said. Vector 035, 40 miles, Angels 8. Received, I said. I'm on my way. I set my course and opened the throttle and hoped I was doing everything right. I checked my ground speed and calculated that it would take me between 10 and 11 minutes to travel 40 miles to this place called Calchis. I cleared the top of the mountain range with 500 feet to spare. And as I went over it, I saw a single solitary goat, brown and white, wandering on the bare rock. Hello, goat. I said aloud into my oxygen mask. I'll bet you don't know the Germans are going to have you for supper before you're very much older. To which, as I realised as soon as I said it, the goat might very well have answered, and the same to you, my boy. You're no better off than I am.
Then I saw below me in the distance a kind of waterway or fjord, and a little cluster of houses on the shore. Calchis, I thought. It must be Calchis. There was one large cargo ship in the waterway, and as I was looking at it, I saw an enormous fountain of spray erupting high in the air close to the ship. I had never seen a bomb exploding in the water before, but I had seen plenty of photographs of it happening. I looked up into the sky above the ship, but I could see nothing there. Then suddenly I spotted the bombers. I saw the small black dots wheeling and circling in the sky high above the ship. It gave me quite a shock. It was my first ever sight of the enemy from my own plane. Quickly as I turned the brass ring of my firing button from safe to fire, I switched on my reflector sight, and a pale red circle of light with two crossbars appeared suspended in the air in front of my face. I headed straight to the little dot. They spotted me while I was still half a mile away, and suddenly all six bombers banked away steeply and dived straight for a great mass of mountains behind Calcus. I rammed the throttle right through the gate. The engine roared and the hurricane leapt forward. I began to catch up fast on the bombers. I was still gaining on them, and when I was about 200 yards behind them, all six rear gunners in the Ju-88s began shooting at me. As David Cook had warned, they were using Tracer, and out of each one of the six rear turrets came a brilliant shaft of orange-red flame. Six different shafts of bright orange-red came arcing towards me from six different turrets. They were like very thin streams of coloured water from six different hose pipes. I was just beginning to realise that I'd got myself into the worst possible position for an attacking fighter to be in when suddenly the passage between the mountains on either side narrowed, and the Ju-88s were forced to go into line astern. This meant that only the last one in the line could shoot at me. That was better. I went a little closer, and by jiggling my plane this way and that, I managed to get the starboard engine of the bomber into my reflector sight. I aimed a bit ahead of the engine and pressed the button. The hurricane gave a small shudder as the eight groundings in the wind all opened up together and a second later, I saw a huge piece of his metal engine cap, the size of a dinner tray, go flying up into the air. Good heavens, I thought. I've hit him. I've actually hit him. Then black smoke came pouring out of his engine. Then I saw one, two, three people jump out of the fuselage and go tumbling earthwards, with legs and arms outstretched in grotesque attitudes. And a moment later, one, two, three parachutes billowed open and began floating gently down between the cliffs, towards the narrow valley below. I watched spellbound. I couldn't believe that I had actually shot down a German bomber, but I was immensely relieved to see the parachute. I opened the throttle again and began to climb up above the mountains. The five remaining Ju-88s had disappeared. I looked around me and all I could see were craggy peaks in every direction. I set a course due south and 15 minutes later I was landing at Alevsis. I parked my hurricane and clambered out. I'd been away for exactly one hour. It seemed like 10 minutes.